All right, well, welcome back, everyone. In today's video, we're going to first do a little more practice on Thevenin's and Norton's theorems, and then we will see how we can use these theorems to determine the maximum power through a circuit element with help from the maximum power transfer theorem. So let's go ahead and get started. Once again, goals for today's video are first to do a little extra practice reviewing Thevenin's and Norton's theorems. If you haven't already done so, I would encourage you to also make sure you have reviewed and understood our previous video on Thevenin's and Norton's theorems. It's such an important skill that I've included a few extra examples in this video as well to make sure everybody is really comfortable finding those equivalent circuits. Another reason for this is because we will need to use our Thevenin equivalent circuit in order to apply the maximum power transfer theorem. As we practice our Thevenin and Norton theorems, we will also keep applying those strategies about when to use each of our circuit tools. So we'll briefly review those strategies. Finally, we will learn about the maximum power transfer theorem. And we will see that the Thevenin equivalent circuit, the Thevenin equivalent circuit is really important to help us determine maximum power transfer conditions. Finally, we'll put everything together and we'll see how Thevenin and Norton and maximum power transfer theorem can be used to design and solve more complicated circuits. So let's go ahead and remind ourselves real quick of some review, and then we will move on to Thevenin, Norton, and maximum power transfer. So just a quick reminder of where we've been and where we're headed. So in our previous two lecture videos, we covered multiple tools to help analyze circuits and make our lives easier. So you would see in our lecture six video, we covered source transformation and superposition. Then in our previous video, we looked at Thevenin's theorem and Norton's theorem. And now today, after reviewing Thevenin and Norton, we will move on to the maximum power transfer theorem. So we've learned a lot of different strategies about how to analyze circuits. And sometimes it can be a little bit tricky to get started when you're solving a circuit problem. So I would also remind you to keep this list of strategies handy as you decide which circuit tools to use for a given problem. You can see our previous recording for some specific examples. Here we'll just review our strategies one more time. So again, make sure you keep that running equation sheet and read those questions carefully so that you have all your knowns and unknowns and all the other information you need. Don't be afraid to draw a picture and to help visualize your circuit. Make sure you understand what's going on. Once you have those first three steps completed, it's a good idea to check if you can simplify your circuit any further. Maybe there's some resistors you can combine. Maybe there's an open or a short that gives you extra information. Maybe you can do a very quick, easy calculation using Kirchhoff's laws. So keep an eye out for that low-hanging fruit, those quick calculations you can do to simplify further. Next recommended technique is to check for anything special about the circuit. Do you have any super nodes? super meshes, dependent sources. If you have anything special, what additional information or hints does that special component give? 
Another very helpful technique is number six. Count the nodes and meshes. Remember, if your circuit has fewer nodes, it might be a good idea to use node analysis and Kirchhoff's current law. That way you don't need to solve as many equations to find your unknowns. Similarly, if your circuit has fewer meshes, then you'd want to consider mesh analysis and Kirchhoff's voltage law. Also keep an eye out for supernodes and supermeshes, as those might give you a, a simpler, easier path as well. Finally, be sure to check the sources in your circuit. If you have multiple independent sources, maybe superposition could help you simplify. Or maybe a source transformation would help you combine sources and make life easier. And also be on the lookout in case you can consider a smaller part of the circuit first in order to determine some useful information. So as we go through the questions in this video, in our previous video, and even in future videos, try thinking about how you can use these strategies to make it easier to solve problems. So you'll remember from our previous lectures, we covered source transformation and superposition, which allow us to simplify our circuits by replacing sources or considering each source separately. And then in our previous video, we looked at Thevenin's theorem. And we saw that by Thevenin's theorem, we can take any linear circuit and we can replace that circuit with an equivalent circuit containing a single voltage source and a single resistor. And you'll remember that Thevenin's equivalent circuit, that voltage value is called the Thevenin voltage. And the resistance of our Thevenin equivalent circuit is called the Thevenin resistance. We also learned last time that Norton's theorem is really similar to Thevenin's theorem. Norton's theorem tells us that any linear circuit can be replaced by an equivalent circuit where that equivalent circuit has an independent current source in parallel with a resistor. And of course, our current source's current value is called the Norton current. And then the resistance of that parallel resistor is the Norton resistance. So Thevenin's and Norton's theorems can be incredibly powerful to help us take some ugly portion of a circuit that we don't like and replace it with something nicer. You may remember from our last video that Norton's and Thevenin's theorem are related by a source transformation. This is really convenient because if we happen to know our Thevenin or Norton equivalent, we just use a source transformation to find the one we don't know. You may have noticed in our previous recording that I recommend you focus on learning how to find Thevenin equivalent. Because once we find our Thevenin voltage and Thevenin resistance, we can easily determine the Norton equivalent. So let's go ahead and review our procedure for Thevenin's theorem. So what we'll do is we'll review the steps for circuits with both dependent and no dependent sources. 
We'll do a couple examples, and then we will see how this helps us when we want to use the maximum power transfer theorem. So I'd encourage you, as we review this procedure, consider trying the two examples that we're about to do on your own. Consider pausing the video and seeing if you can complete those examples successfully on your own. And of course, if you do have any other questions as you work on these problems and get more familiar with the techniques, feel free to reach out. So let's go ahead and review the procedure. Now remember, for Thevenin's theorem, there's actually two different cases. If our circuit has no dependent sources, then we follow the procedure shown here. If our circuit does contain a dependent source, then we need to follow the other procedure shown on the next slide. So just to remind everyone, the procedure I recommend you follow is shown here. The first step is to figure out what part of the circuit do you want to find Thevenin an equivalent for? Sometimes this is done for you, but sometimes you may need to separate the source portion from the load portion. So just be aware of that if depending on the question you are given. Next, we want to find the Thevenin voltage. And remember, the Thevenin voltage is equal to VOC, or the open circuit voltage. So once you find VOC, you can set that as your Thevenin equivalent voltage. And then remember, when you find Thevenin resistance, the procedure is different depending on whether you have a dependent source. If your circuit does not contain dependent sources, then you follow the procedure shown here. Notice we first need to turn off all our independent sources, and we replace voltage sources with shorts or a plain wire and current sources are replaced with an open or a broken wire. Once you have turned off all of the independent voltage sources and all of the independent current sources, then you calculate the resistance of your overall circuit when you pass from one open terminal to the other. So you may remember, this is where we might draw a lot of stick figures to help us keep track, depending on our circuit. We want to make sure we correctly determine the resistance when we walk from one terminal to the other. So the Thevenin resistance is given by that equivalent resistance when we walk from that first open terminal to the second. Finally, once we have determined our Thevenin resistance, then we can replace the original circuit with the Thevenin equivalent, where the voltage is given by our Thevenin voltage, and our resistance is given by the Thevenin resistance. Finally, Remember that if you want to find the Norton equivalent, you just first find the Thevenin equivalent and do that source transformation. So now let's review the procedure for Thevenin's theorem when we do have a dependent source in our circuit. So remember once again, you want to be very careful that you use the correct approach for the circuit that you have. So you'll notice again that the first two steps are the same. 
as the no dependent source case. So we still find the Thevenin in voltage as normal. But remember what happens with Thevenin in resistance. The first two steps are the same as before. But notice step C here. For a circuit containing a dependent source, we need to connect an external source VEX across the open terminals. So remember, if we had some circuit we were trying to find Thevenin of, we would actually connect an external source VEX with current IEX passing through. We would also turn off any independent sources. And then notice we would need to solve for Thevenin and resistance as VEX divided by IEX. So that would give us our Thevenin and resistance. Once you have found that Thevenin and resistance, then all you need to do is replace the original circuit with the Thevenin equivalent. And if needed, do a source transformation to find the Norton equivalent. So let's go ahead and do a couple examples to help everybody review these procedures. It's really important that you understand how to find Thevenin equivalents so that we can use them later when we work with maximum power transfer. So let's take a look at our first example. Here we have a circuit given to us, and we want to determine the Norton current and the Norton equivalent for the circuit shown. So basically, we want to find IN, RN, and ultimately what would this circuit look like if we replace it with its Norton equivalent? So let's go ahead and try applying the techniques we've covered so far. First question to consider. We need to find VOC, right? We want to find that open circuit voltage so that we can determine VP, right? Our Thevenin and voltage is given by VOC. Remember, once we know Thevenin and voltage and Thevenin and resistance, we can get our Norton equivalent. So how would we find VOC for this circuit? Think about the techniques we've covered. Is there anything special about this circuit? What strategy would you use? Take a moment and think about it. for everybody. Did you notice this? Notice we have a super node. So it's certainly possible to solve this circuit using node analysis or mesh analysis or Kirchhoff's laws but it's actually quite a bit easier to solve this circuit if we use a supernode. So for this question, I'm gonna go ahead and find my VOC using the supernode. It's especially convenient to use a supernode here because we know that no current will flow
through the 2 ohm resistor. So we can say that our super node basically has VOC on the right hand side. Notice on the left hand side, we're six volts lower, right? So over here on, on the other side of our, on the negative side of our super node source, we're actually sitting at VOC minus 6 volts. So that's pretty convenient, right? Notice we have a super node. We got VOC on the right hand side, VOC minus 6 on the left. We'll let our ground be on the bottom of our circuit. So now that we've got that super node in there, we can apply Kirchhoff's current law. So here I'm just going to draw in some currents. Remember, right now we do not have any current flowing through that 2 ohm resistor. So in this case, we just have I1 entering. I2 leaving, and I3 leaving. So Kirchhoff's current law gives us that. And now we can rewrite Kirchhoff's current law in terms of our voltage VOC. Notice current I1 is just 4 amps. That's easy. For I2, we get VOC minus 6 divided by 6 ohms. And for current I3, we get VOC divided by 3 ohms. So if we substitute, we end up with the equation 4 amps minus VOC minus 6 divided by 6 ohms, minus VOC divided by 3 ohms, equals 0. So would you look at that? We've got one equation and one unknown. So let's go ahead and determine what VOC is. If I multiply both sides by 18 to get rid of, you know what, let's just multiply both sides by 6 to get rid of the 6 and the 3. I want to get rid of those fractions. So if I multiply both sides by 6, I'm going to end up with 24 minus VOC, and so again, be careful here. Notice the distribution of the subtraction. So watch that negative sign. We have 24 minus VOC minus 6 minus 2 VOC equals 0. I'm going to distribute that negative. So I'll have 24 minus VOC plus 6. Again, minus negative becomes a positive minus 2 VOC equals 0. So if I combine like terms, I get minus 3 VOC plus 30 equals 0. That gives us VOC, 3 VOC equals 30. So VOC is going to equal 10 volts. So that wasn't too bad. 
Notice how that super node really helped us simplify things. We could have used mesh equations or some other approach, but the super node simplified things quite a bit, and we only had to solve one equation. So now that we have found VOC, we know that our Thevenin voltage must also be 10 volts. Let's now find our Thevenin resistance, and then we can find our Norton equivalent. So remember, in this case, we have no dependent sources here. So in this case, our first step is to turn off the independent sources. The voltage source becomes a short And our current source becomes an open. Then, once we've turned off our sources, we determine the resistance when walking through the circuit. across the open terminals. So here's what we get. Our four amp source becomes an open. Our six volt source becomes a short. So we still have this six ohm resistor here. We get a plain wire where our voltage source was. We get a 3 ohm resistor on the other side of that 6 volt source. And notice we still have the 2 ohm resistor from before. So now it's time to walk from terminal A to terminal B. So notice when we walk from A to B, we encounter a 2 ohm resistor in series with a 6 ohm and 3 ohm resistor in parallel. So be careful that you correctly recognize the 2 ohm resistor relative to our open terminal. That 2 ohm resistor, everybody has to walk through it. So 2 ohm resistor is in series. And then we have to choose whether to go through the 6 ohm or a 3 ohm resistor. So those two are in parallel. So in this case, we have 2 ohms for our series resistor plus 6 times 3 over 6 plus 3. 6 times 3 is 18. 6 plus 3 is 9. So our equivalent resistance becomes 4 ohms. Therefore, our Thevenin in resistance is 4 ohms. So we're almost done. Remember, we determined here that our Thevenin in voltage is 10 volts, and our Thevenin in resistance we found to be 4 ohms. 
but we wanted to find our Norton equivalent. So we need to do that source transformation. So if we do our source transformation, we determine that our Norton current is going to be equal to our Thevenin in voltage divided by our Thevenin in resistance, which is 10 volts, 4 ohms, gives us 2.5 amps. And we determine that our Norton resistance is just 4 ohms. So our Norton equivalent will look like this. And there you have it. Notice that that super node really helped with this problem. So you'll want to make sure you get really comfortable solving these Thevenin and Norton problems with all the other techniques we already know. If you're really comfortable with node analysis, mesh analysis, super nodes, super meshes, you'll find it's a lot easier to determine the VOC and the Norton and Thevenin resistance. All right, so that is our example for a circuit that does not have a dependent source. Let's now do an extra example of a circuit which does contain a dependent source. So as you remember, when we have a dependent source in our circuit, the procedure for finding Thevenin and resistance becomes a little bit different. So let's give this circuit a try. Here we have this fun looking circuit with a dependent source. So we know that we need to use the dependent source procedure. When solving for our Thevenin and resistance. Let's go ahead and give this a try. We do want to find the entire Thevenin and also our Norton current, so let's start out by finding VOC. that we can determine our Thevenin and voltage. In this case, VOC is the voltage across those open terminals. I'll label them A and B. So take a look at this circuit and think about how could we find VOC for this circuit? Does anything stand out to you about this circuit? A couple things to notice. Notice that VOC is equal to the voltage across the 2 ohm resistor. If we let the bottom node of our circuit be ground. Voltage across that 2 ohm resistor is going to be equal to our open circuit voltage. You might have noticed that there's a bunch of voltage sources over here, so that looks a little bit tricky. Notice that we also have 
I also have just one single loop. If we have just one single loop, what kind of strategy should we use for this question? If you remember, this is a good opportunity to use Kirchhoff's voltage law. So remember, if we take advantage of that one loop, we won't have to solve as many equations as if we did something like mesh analysis, or as if we did something like node analysis. Because remember, there's actually quite a few nodes in the circuit, but only one loop. So let's go ahead and apply Kirchhoff's voltage law. I'm going to go ahead and start walking clockwise around my circuit. And I'm just going to sum the voltage rises and drops. If I do that, I'm going to go ahead and use my standard bank account convention. So I see that I get plus 1.5 VA volts when I go across that source. I'm also going to gain 7 volts when I walk across that independent voltage source. And then next, I'm going to lose some voltage VA when I go across that 3 ohm resistor. But right now, I'm just going to go ahead and assume I have some current I flowing throughout this loop. So I'm going to go ahead and, in this case, I'm going to write my voltage as 3I, or minus 3I, because it's 3 ohms times I amps of current. And notice my last resistor, that is going to be VOC volts, and that's also equal to minus 2I because we have 2 ohms times I amps of current going through there. So notice here I assumed a clockwise mesh current I. If I simplify, I get plus 1.5 VA plus 7 minus 5I equals 0. I have one equation and two unknowns. I need another equation relating VA and I. And of course here, we can tell that VA is the voltage across the 3 ohm resistor. So I can say that VA equals 3I. Basically, I need to substitute the second equation to my first equation. And here, if I plug in VA equals 3I, I'll get 1.5 times 3I plus 7 minus 5I equals 0. I can solve for I. And I determined, in this case, I have 4.5I plus 7 minus 5I equals 0. That gives me minus 0 0.5i plus 7 equals 0. So I can say 0 
i equals 7. So therefore, I determine that i must be equal to 14 amps. And of course, I need to plug i back in and use i to find VOC. So in this case, VOC is equal to 2i. So I determine that my VOC, my Thaven and voltage, is equal to 14 times 2, or 28 volts. All right, so now let's go ahead and find our Thaven and resistance. Remember, we need to use the procedure for circuits with dependent sources. So in this case, just like before, we turn off our voltage and current sources. Just the independent sources. And then we attach an external source, VEX, with current, IEX. Then we need to find an expression for. VEX over IEX to give us RT. So let's go ahead and apply this procedure. So we have 1.5 VA prime. So remember, I use VA prime to avoid confusion. with VA since we turned off our seven volt source. So this VA prime is most likely not going to be the same thing as our original VA. This voltage source becomes a short and we still have that 3 ohm resistor from before. And then we have the 2 ohm resistor from before. But now we need to attach our external source VEX, which provides current IEX. And we need to find an expression. or VEX over IEX. And also remember, we used VA prime there. Remember, that is referring to the voltage VA prime across that 3 ohm resistor. So we want to find an expression relating VEX and IEX. So a good place to start is by considering Kirchhoff's current law at our topmost node. Notice that the voltage at my topmost node is going to be VEX because my source is directly connected to that point. So let's go ahead and apply Kirchhoff's current law and in this case, I will go ahead and assume I have some current I1 entering, I2 leaving, and then we have IEX entering. So by Kirchhoff's current law, I get plus I1 
minus I2 plus IEX must be zero. The Kuljoff's law will allow me to relate those variables that I'm interested in. So in this case, my current I1 can be given by 1.5 VA prime minus VEX divided by my three ohms. My current I2 can be given by VEX divided by two ohms. And then my current IEX is just coming in. We leave that as is. We need a second expression, which relates Vx, Va prime, and Iex. So what other expression could we use here? So let's write one more expression relating Vex and Va prime. And another expression can be obtained using Kirchhoff's voltage law. So in this case, if I apply Kirchhoff's voltage law to the perimeter of my circuit, I can determine Again, if I just walk, if I walk clockwise around, I can determine that plus 1.5 VA prime minus VA prime minus VEX equals zero. So in this case, I can determine that 0 0.5 VA prime is equal to VEX. Or I can similarly say that VA prime is equal to 2 VEX. Notice that I can then take this and substitute back in to that earlier equation. Let's go ahead and perform that substitution. So here's what we have. We have VA prime equals 2 VEX, and we have our other equation, 1.5 VA prime minus VEX over 3, minus VEX over 2, plus IEX equals 0. So if we substitute in, we determine that we have 1.5 times 2 VEX minus VEX divided by 3 minus VEX divided by 2 plus IEX equals 0. If we multiply both sides by 6, we determine that we have in this case, it will be 2 times 1.5 times 2 VEX minus 2 VEX minus 3 VEX plus 6 IEX equals 0. So 2 times 1.5 times 2, that gives us 6 VEX minus 2 VEX minus 3 VEX plus 6 IEX 
zero. Six minus two minus three, that's six minus five, or just VEX plus six IEX equals zero. So VEX is negative six IEX. So VEX divided by IEX is equal to negative six. That means Thevenin and resistance is negative six ohms. You might be thinking, whoa, what's going on with that? So it is possible to get a negative Thevenin and resistance. And usually this happens in cases of dependent sources. So remember, because the dependent source could be potentially producing different amounts of voltage, the Thevenin equivalent may model those voltage changes using a negative Thevenin resistance. At the end of the day, this is intended to be an equivalent circuit. So it's a model that gives the same IV behavior as the original circuit with the dependent source. So don't panic if you see the negative Thevenin and resistance. That can happen sometimes, particularly when you have dependent sources. So now all that's left is to find our Norton current. So we know our Norton current is Thevenin and voltage divided by our Thevenin and resistance. And in this case, we go back and we see that our Thevenin and voltage was 28 volts. We divide by our negative six ohms and we determine our Norton current in this case will be equal to negative 14 thirds amps. All right, so hopefully that was some helpful review for everyone. And please do feel free to reach out if you have any further questions on these topics. Let's go ahead and continue on with maximum power transfer theorem. You'll remember in our previous video, we introduced the concept of a source and a load. This is especially important when we talk about maximum power transfer theorem. So, Again, just a reminder that when we talk about sources and loads, remember the source is the thing that supplies energy to our circuit. And the load is the thing that receives energy. So the sources could be our power supplies, our generator, maybe a battery. Loads could be things like electric motors, antennas, speakers. So notice that the source is the thing that supplies the energy. And we mentioned last time that the load can vary. So good example is a power outlet. We Often the source will stay fixed, but different things could be plugged into the power outlet to provide different loads. So let's see how this fits in with maximum power transfer theorem. So many engineering applications will require that we transfer as much power as possible. So often we want to very efficiently transfer power between a source and a load. We don't want to waste time energy or money with inefficient transfer. So examples of this could be designing antennas. Maybe you're delivering electrical power with power lines. Maybe you want to quickly charge a cell phone or power an electric motor. Tons of situations where we want to transfer power as much as possible and as efficiently as possible. 
And this is where the maximum power transfer theorem comes in. The maximum power transfer theorem tells us how to design circuits so that we transfer the maximum possible amount of power. Let's take a look at what this theorem says. So the maximum power transfer theorem says that maximum power is transferred to a load when the load's resistance and the load's resistance and that load resistance is equal to the source's Thevenin resistance. So notice here, if we want to transfer maximum power between this source and that load resistor, then we want our source's Thevenin resistance to match the load's resistance. So that condition must be met in order to transfer maximum possible power. We'll see the derivation on the next slide in case you're curious, but you'll see that the maximum power that we transfer, so if our load resistance is equal to the Thevenin resistance of the source, then the equation here gives us the amount of power transferred. So we can see in this particular case, the maximum power we would be able to transfer between our source and our load is given by the Thevenin equivalent voltage of the source, that's Vs squared, divided by four times the Thevenin resistance. So we need to be able to calculate Thevenin equivalent in order to easily determine maximum power transfer. This is another really important application of Thevenin's and Norton's theorem. So where does this theorem actually come from? Like most of our tools in circuits class, these can actually be derived directly from Kirchhoff's laws. And so we can see if we use power and Ohm's law, we can basically show that if we have a fixed source voltage and Thevenin resistance, and we use power as current squared times load resistance, we can take the derivative with respect to load resistance. So again, this is derivative of power with respect to load resistance. And of course, recall with derivatives that when the derivative is zero, we can find our maximum point. And we see in this case, our derivative is zero when our load resistance equals the Thevenin resistance of the source. I don't expect you to memorize this derivation or show it on exams, but it is good to know where this comes from. So why does all of this matter? Once again, as we mentioned, engineers need to use maximum power transfer theorem all the time. We want to make sure we are efficiently transferring power between our sources and our loads. Think about communications with antennas, energy sources, electricity transfer, 
even just optimizing a system. You don't want to be wasting energy. We'll also see that the equivalent circuits and Thevenin's and Norton's theorems will come back, and we'll use them again when we talk about capacitors and inductors. And later on, we're going to see that similar theorems hold true for AC circuits as well. So it's very important that you understand these fundamentals. One more important term that comes up is this term called matching or matched. When our source and our load have the same resistance, so in this case, so that maximum power is transferred, we say that the source and load are matched. And so in many practical applications, our goal is to make sure that our source's Thevenin resistance matches the load's resistance. That way we can get maximum power transfer. There's a couple other useful design implications of maximum power transfer. Suppose we wanted to transfer maximum possible current. If we want to transfer maximum possible current, then we would want our load resistance to be much smaller than the source resistance. Remember V equals IR, so if our load resistance R is smaller, then we get more current I flowing through that load. On the other hand, if we want to transfer maximum possible voltage, then we want our load resistance to be much larger than the source resistance. In that case, we're not going to get a lot of current through the load, but we'll be able to get more of the voltage from our source. One other thing that comes up when we're working with maximum power transfer and equivalent circuits is source modeling. Often we model real sources or non-ideal sources using a voltage source with the resistor in series. And the resistance of that series resistor gets a special name called the internal resistance. So most of the time when you're working with voltage sources, you want the internal resistance of your source to be as low as possible. Ideally, you would have zero ohms of internal resistance, but usually there will be some very small amount of resistance in your voltage source. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at some examples of how we can use maximum power transfer. First, let's consider a AA battery. Suppose we were to represent a AA battery using this circuit. And in this case, we are told that the battery's resistance will be 0.15 ohms when our temperature is 20 degrees, and our, our resistance increases to 0.9 ohms if our temperature cools to minus 40 degrees. We're told that we can assume our load is optimized so that maximum power transfer conditions will be met. So the question's asking us, what is the maximum power that the battery can transfer at each temperature? And we're to assume that our source voltage from the battery is 1.5 volts at both of those temperatures. All right, so let's just remind ourselves does the maximum power transfer theorem tell us? Well, we know that our maximum power transferred is equal to Vs squared 
over 4RT, where Vs is our source's Thevenin voltage, and our value RT is the source's Thevenin resistance. And note, this equation requires that our source's Thevenin resistance is equal to the load resistance. But notice that we are allowed to assume maximum power transfer conditions are met. So we are told to assume this condition is met. So we'll go ahead and assume this condition is met at both temperatures. All right then, so let's first consider our case, the 20 degrees Celsius case. So at the temperature, 20 degrees Celsius, what do we know? Well, we know Vs should be 1.5 volts. And we also know Rs should be equal to our load because maximum power transfer is met. And we're told that we're 0 0.15 ohms. So notice we can go ahead and substitute in and we determine our maximum power is 1.5 volts squared divided by 4 times our Thevenin resistance, which and in this case is 0 0.15 ohms. So if we do the math, we determine that our Pmax at 20 degrees Celsius is equal to 3.75 watts. Now let's consider the other case. Okay, so at temperature T is minus 40 degrees Celsius, what do we get? Well, notice we're told that our voltage is still 1.5 volts, but our resistance has now become 0 0.9 ohms. So if we substitute into our maximum power transfer equation, we still get 1.5 volts squared up top. But in the denominator, we're dividing by a larger number. So we determine the maximum power we're going to be able to transfer. Well, that's going to be 1.5 squared divided by 4 times 0 0.9. In this case, we're only going to be able to transfer 0 0.625 watts. So notice at that colder temperature, our battery doesn't do quite as well. You may have seen this in real life if you've ever parked a car outside in the wintertime. You might see sometimes that battery will have trouble starting if it's too cold. Let's go ahead and consider another example. Now let's look at a case where we might need to select a resistance in order to design a circuit. So suppose we have a circuit that looks like this one. We have a bridge circuit 
and there's a two milliamp current source inside the center of the bridge. Question's asking us two things. First, what load resistance should we choose in order to ensure maximum power transfer conditions are met? Second part of the question asks, find the maximum power which will be transferred if we have indeed met the maximum power transfer requirements. Let's start with the first part. How do we find the load resistance that will give us maximum power transfer? Well, let's remind ourselves that to have maximum power transfer, have maximum power transfer, the Thevenin resistance of the source that's our RT, that must be equal to the load resistance. So we need to find our Thevenin resistance of the circuit connected to the load. So what that means is let's go ahead and ignore the load portion for now. And let's go ahead and determine if these terminals are open. Let's find the Thevenin resistance of that load circuit or of the source circuit. And so remember, in order to find our Thevenin resistance, we need to follow the procedure that we learned earlier. And notice, since we have no dependent source, so what we can do is we can turn off the independent current source. And then once we've done that, then we can find the resistance across the open terminals. So let's go ahead and see what we're dealing with here. If I replace that two milliamp source with an open, notice that I end up with two parallel paths. I'm gonna go ahead and convert to ohms so that I don't mess up my units later. So we essentially end up with two parallel resistors. We end up having 4,000 plus 8,000 or 12,000 ohms on the left hand side, and we have 2,000 plus 6,000 or 8,000 ohms on the right hand side. So the equivalent resistance, which gives us our Thevenin resistance, that's just a 12,000 ohm resistor in parallel with an 8,000 ohm resistor. So we can go ahead and calculate. And if we do that calculation, we'll determine that our Thevenin and resistance is 4,800 ohms. 
So in this case, the load resistance should be the same as our source's Thevenin in resistance. Our max power transfer. So that means our Thevenin, our load resistance, should be 4,800 ohms. All right. So we have successfully finished the first part of our question. Here we determined that our load resistance must be 4,800 ohms. But now we need to find the maximum power which will be transferred in this case. So let's go ahead and remind ourselves that our maximum power that we're going to transfer that's going to be equal to Vs squared over 4RT, where again Vs is our source's haven in voltage, and RT is our source's haven in resistance. So basically, to determine P max, we need to find we need to find the S, or in this case, the Thevenin in voltage of our source. So let's take a look at how we could do that. Remember, we're going to disconnect our load. So our Thevenin voltage is just going to be the open circuit voltage across the upper and lower terminals. So in this case, we need to go ahead and find our Thevenin in voltage. So how could we find that Thevenin in voltage VT using the information we have here? Well, notice there's some useful things that we can do for this circuit. Notice we have a shared current source. So a super mesh might be a good place to start. Let's go ahead and define some currents. I'm going to let my current in the upper half of my circuit be I1, and the current in the lower half of my circuit be I2. And notice I can write a Kirchhoff's voltage law equation around my super mesh. I'm going to go ahead and try writing that Kirchhoff's voltage law equation. I'm just going to be careful of my polarities here. I'm just going to temporarily label them to be in the same direction as my direction I'm walking for my super mesh. 
So in this case, I determined that the voltage drop crossed my 8,000 ohm resistor. Then I have minus the voltage drop across my 4,000 ohm resistor, minus the voltage drop across my 2,000 ohm resistor, minus the voltage drop across my 6,000 ohm resistor. Well, those must all sum to zero. Notice some of the currents are flowing in the opposite direction that I was summing my voltages. So some of these signs might end up getting flipped. Let's take a look at what each of these voltages are. Well, the voltage across my 8,000 ohm resistor, that's just going to be 8,000 I2. A voltage drop across my 4,000 ohm resistor is going to be 4,000 ohms. But notice that I1 is flowing in the opposite direction as I was walking for my super mesh. So I'm going to put a negative sign there to indicate that the current I was interested in was going in the opposite direction as I1. Notice for my 2000 ohm resistor, I am also moving in the opposite direction as my current I1. So my voltage will be 2000 ohms times negative I1 as well. And then finally, my voltage across the 6000 ohm resistor, that's going to be 6000 ohms times the current I2 which is flowing in the same direction as I was walking. So using this approach, I end up with negative 8,000 I2 minus negative 4,000 I1. So that becomes plus 4,000 I1 minus negative V2,000. So that will become plus 2,000 I1 and minus 6,000 I2, all that must sum to zero. And notice if I combine terms, I can determine that I have 8,000 plus 6,000 times I2. That equals, on the other side, I would have I1 times 4,000 plus 2,000. So basically, I can determine that 14,000 I2 equals 6,000 I1. I also know that I1 plus I2 must equal 2 milliamps, or 0 0.002 amps. I have two equations, two unknowns. So here I need to solve for I1 and I2. And in this case, if I go ahead and solve for those equations using a solver, I can determine that my current I1 is going to be 1.4 milliamps, and I2 is going to be 0 0.6 milliamps. Now all that's left is to find VOC using I1 and I2. Let's take a look at how we could do that. Well, we know that VOC is just the voltage from the top portion of our circuit down to the bottom. So one way of determining VOC
is to determine the voltage when we walk across those two terminals. So for example, I can determine that VOC for my Thevenin and voltage, we just need to consider the voltage across either of these two paths through our circuit. Because we know by Kirchhoff's voltage law, if we were to walk all the way around the circuit, we would know that plus VOC minus, for example, the voltage across our 4,000 ohm resistor minus the voltage across our 8,000 ohm resistor, that must sum to zero. So let's go ahead and plug in now that we know how to find those voltages. In this case, the voltage across our 4,000 ohm resistor, that's equal to 4,000 ohms times our current, which in this case is our current I1. And then notice the voltage across our 8,000 ohm resistor is equal to 8,000. And then notice here that our current I2 is going in the opposite direction as the direction that we are walking. So we just need to be mindful of that. So notice that our direction here, this, this current through that resistor, this is actually negative I2 because we're going in the opposite way. So we can go ahead and substitute that in. So we see that VOC is going to be equal to V4000 plus V8000. And then again, we plug in what we know. So our voltage across our 4,000 ohm resistor, well, that's just going to be 4,000 times I1, where I1 is 1.4 milliamps, or 0 0.0014 amps. And then notice our current I2. Watch the negative sign there. So in this case, the plus V8000, that's going to become a plus. But notice we have 8000 times negative I2. So we have to multiply by 0 0.0006. Again, because the negative is due to the current direction. We're walking in the opposite direction of I2, so we have to flip the sign. So therefore, we determine our VOC. We sum up both of these quantities. We'll determine VOC, or Thevenin and voltage, is equal to negative 0 0.8 volts. So finally, our last step is to find our maximum power transfer. And so, of course, we know that P max will be Thevenin and voltage squared for 4RT. So if we go ahead and square that, that'll be negative 0 0.8 squared divided by 4 times our Thevenin and resistance, which is 4,800 ohms. And units here are volts. So we determine the maximum power that we're going to be able to transfer will be 0 0.64 divided by 4 times 4,800. And if we go ahead and complete the math, we'll determine that that's about 0 0.0333 milliwatts. So there you have it. Notice that by combining all these tools together, 
You know, we use super meshes, Thevenin, Kirchhoff's laws, all the tools we know so far. We were able to successfully determine what load resistance we needed and the maximum power we could transfer. And there we go. So that concludes our video for today. So hopefully now you're more comfortable using Thevenin's and Norton's theorems to find equivalent circuits. And definitely get used to applying those strategies and intuition to help determine what approach to use when solving problems. Also, make sure you add that maximum power transfer theorem to your equation sheet. And get comfortable using the Thevenin and equivalent and the maximum power transfer theorem to help design circuits. Finally, definitely take some time to go back through these examples on your own and make sure you're comfortable using Thevenin, Norton, and maximum power transfer theorem to solve more complex circuits. Thanks everyone for joining the fun, and we will see you all in the next video.